This review is going to be a little bit different to my other camera reviews that I've made for a number of reasons. The first one is last summer, in fact on the 3rd of August 2020, I published a video that was 75 minutes long, the second longest review that I've ever made for YouTube. And as of right now, it's had actually almost 200,000 views, which for my channel is pretty high. So what does that have to do with this review? Well, that was for the Sony Alpha 7S III otherwise known as the A7S III. And the FX3 is an A7S III with a different body. So yeah, pretty much all the changes are physical. The features, the recording modes, the menus, the image, they're all identical to the A7S III. The only software feature that was different when I tested out the camera was that it had an additional picture profile, number 11, which has a cinetone in it. Depending on when you're watching this and if I manage to get my review out on time, there is a firmware update coming out or has come out given the A7S III S Cinetone. I will of course cover the key features of the FX3 in this video, but if you want a really detailed look at what the camera is capable of, I highly recommend you watch my A7S III review. It is long, but I promise you the time will fly by. It's informative, funny, and entertaining, I think. Well, that's what the comments say anyway. What I want to concentrate in this review are the physical changes, both the great and the not so great. I'm trying to figure out why Sony made this camera, who they made it for, what I wish they'd done differently and maybe could still do to make it more compelling for many people, including myself, and how it fits into the whole alpha and cinema line of Sony cameras. The FX3 is an incredible video camera. It has specs and performance which outclass cameras many times its price. This isn't news though, because as I've said, it's an A7S III in a different body. In my best cameras of 2020 video, which was the last video that I actually made, I awarded the best video camera of the year to the Alpha 7S III. Even though it isn't officially classified as one by Sony, it has the designation Interchangeable Lens Camera E-Mount, ILCG, which they have used for all of their stills cameras since 2013. So despite being a mirrorless stills camera, officially, it's also a killer video camera. Sony's FX6 camera came in a close second, but the value for money of the A7S III pushed it ahead for me. And the FX6 has the new acronym ILME, which stands for Interchangeable Lens Movie E-Mount, which the FX3 also has, even though it is as much a stills camera as the A7S III. Anyway, enough about names for now. The video you get from these cameras is just beautiful. I cannot emphasize this enough. Here's a quick run through of the headline features of the FX3 and the A7S3. They both have the same full frame sensor. Now many people say the camera is sampling the sensor one to one, which isn't strictly true. The horizontal resolution of the sensor is 4,240 pixels, and it downsamples that to get to 3840 by 2160 UHD 4K. There is no crop. The horizontal field of view is identical in stills and video with both cameras. It's like this in 4K up to 60p, but when you get into 100p, 120p, you do get a 1.1 times crop in this mode it is actually sampling one to one because downsampling is just too processor intensive. You also get full sensor 1080p recording up to 240 frames per second. Although when you are in this mode and the 200 frames per second mode, you are actually getting an effective pixels of just 1408 by 804, even though the recording will be 1920 by 1080. So it isn't as detailed as a normal HD mode and does have 
moire and the aliasing. So because of this I do tend to mainly use the 4K 120p for slow motion and it does look so much better than the 200 and 240p. There is no Super 35mm mode in 4K as there aren't enough pixels for that, but there is an HD. But you can use clear image zoom to get a 1.5 times nearly flawless digital crop in 4K, although you do lose most of the autofocus tracking abilities. Both cameras have identical recording codecs, all of which are capable of 10-bit 422, with a varying degree of compression depending on what you select. There's a really superb XAVC SI interframe codec, which I really love because it lets you edit natively without having to transcode these proxies on most modern computers. Both of the cameras have the same dual card slot, which are dual media, taking SD cards or the new CF Express Type A cards for the more demanding codecs. You can record in every frame rate, including the very highest ones without needing these V90 SD cards are fine. It's just you won't be able to record them in iframe. Neither camera are officially called dual ISO sensors, but well, unofficially they pretty much are. In S-Log3, both cameras' base sensitivity is 640 ISO, with a usable dynamic range of about 13 stops. When you get to the second sort of base ISO of 12,800, you have almost the same noise levels as 640 ISO, with only a small drop in dynamic range. I have a dedicated video all about this, which is linked in the description below, and somewhere up there as well. Both cameras have a full-size HDMI out, which is capable of outputting 10-bit 422 uncompressed video, as well as 16-bit RAW, but you do need a compatible recorder, and currently that means the Atomos Ninja 5, which takes that 16-bit RAW and converts it into 12-bit ProRes RAW. It's not capable of recording in any other RAW format. The video autofocus is the second best I've ever used on any camera. It was the best until I received a review sample of the new Alpha 1 last week, which is even better, this camera here. The way that it is able to rack focus in autofocus is so smooth, you would swear it was a fully manual lens being pulled by a focus puller. That being said, the A7S III is no slouch. It has amazing face and eye tracking ability. It works in every single frame rate and resolution, including RAW. It really is just incredible. As is the touchscreen tracking feature. You just touch the subject or object that you want to be in focus, and it will stick to them and follow them almost like glue. And when I say touch the object, I mean the screen, not the actual, you know what I'm saying. What it doesn't have in video is animal eye autofocus tracking. In stills mode it does, just not in video mode. Even though in the video autofocus menu you can select it and it clearly shows as a stills video feature via the icon. It just doesn't work. Sony also says it doesn't work. But it is time for it to work. Oddly enough, when in human mode, it does track some animals, but it is pretty rare. Canon animal video autofocus is absolutely tremendous. So, come on, Sony. I've had a petition going since last year, and there's been nowhere near enough people signing it. So, if we can get a lot more signatures, maybe we can make it happen. The FX6 came out in late 2020, and with it launched Sony's Cinema Line series. It's unusual in that it launched the line because it wasn't the first camera in the new lineup. Both the FX9 and the high-end cinema camera, the Venice, were included as part of this lineup, which came out much earlier. They just became part of the cinema line when that was launched. So what is this cinema line? Actually, let's start with something a bit more basic. What is a cinema camera? Well, for me, it's a term that has really become rather meaningless. I previously had always considered digital cameras made specifically to film movies, big budget TV shows, high-end commercials, etc. to be cinema cameras. The cameras I'm referring to are cameras like the Arri Alexas, the Reds, the Canon C700, Sony F65 and the Venice. 
These are true cinema cameras to me, cameras which are designed to be used with a crew, not by a single operator. They're cameras that can be integrated into proper large set environments with all the professional connections you need and have very high-end recording options and with an image designed to mimic film as closely as possible. They also need to be able to shoot 24p dead on, not 23.98, 24p, and have the ability to shoot in the DCI aspect ratio. These days, everything that isn't a stills camera seems to be called a cinema camera. And for most, it's really just marketing, as these are video cameras, and there's nothing wrong with calling them that. Look, is Canon C100 really a cinema camera, for example? Of course not, but it was a really great budget Super 35mm video camera. So, looking at Sony's cinema line, I personally would call the Venice a cinema camera, the FX9A broadcast video camera, and the FX6 is a general purpose video camera. What makes the FX9A broadcast video camera are things like the legacy codecs, the ability to record in the wonderful interlaced, and to be integrated into a broadcast infrastructure. The FX6 has no legacy codecs or ability to record in interlaced. It's not designed for broadcast, but of course it still can be used in broadcast. It can also be used for most things, like the FX9 can too. Both of these cameras would work really well in cinema productions, most likely being used as B cameras, but totally capable of being the main camera. They both shoot DCI 4K in dead on 24p, they both shoot in 10-bit 422 and can do 16-bit raw out, although the FX9 does need that rather big extension on the back to do so. The FX6 doesn't. So that brings us to the FX3. New Cinematic Freedom. This is the Cinema Line FX3. It certainly looks the part with the lovely, nice grey colour introduced with the Sony Venice. It's a gorgeous design, so much slicker and more modern looking than the rather tired and outdated Alpha series of mirrorless cameras. But it is still an A7S III within that lovely exterior. And the A7S III is not part of the Cinema Line despite being essentially the same as the FX3. Confusing, isn't it? It doesn't really matter what a camera's called. Does the naming really matter? Well, no, of course not. But it does muddy the waters, making it really quite confusing for people who are looking to buy a camera. It certainly looks like a mirrorless stills camera, right down to the hand grip with a shutter button. Yes, this camera takes photos too. It has all the same photographic performance as the A7S III. It has the exact same connections on the body as the A7S III. We have the full-size HDMI, 3.5mm mic input and 3.5mm headphone out, USB-C for power delivery charging and connecting to your computer, and a micro USB for things like time-lapse triggers. Although it does have a nice interval mode in the stills menu, which works really well. If you want a really simple way of shooting time lapse, you can go into S and Q mode and go as low as one frame per second. That looks really nice. It has the exact same fully articulating LCD screen as the A7S III, which is a shame as it's not the best. I wish the screen was bigger, brighter, and had a higher resolution. In fact, we have the same quality screen on the Alpha One, their flagship camera. 
it really is time to improve your LCD screens, please, Sony. And this is even more important on the FX3 because the single biggest difference to the A7S III is there's now no EVF. They've lopped it off. They've decapitated the A7S III. So you can now only use the LCD screen unless you connect an external viewing device, obviously. Now, personally, this is a big problem for me. The A7S III has the best EVF I've used. It's an absolute joy to use. Yes, it is fixed in one position, because that's what stills cameras EVFs are like. Yeah, so it's not that much use on the tripod unless it's exactly your height, but for handheld shooting, it's so great. Yeah, when it's too awkward to use for a specific angle or shot, then you do have the articulating LCD screen. By losing the EVF, there's now a totally flat top of the camera, which is rather reminiscent of the APS-C line of stills cameras like you know, the A6500, etc. And also the new A7C, although they still have a little EVF in the top left hand corner. On top of the FX3, there is the usual multi interface shoe, but something new is three quarter 20 mounting points. Two of them are used for the included handle pro audio unit. This is very much based on the XR K3M device that you can buy for Sony cameras with MI shoes gives you two XLR TRS combo jacks, which are switchable from line to mic to phantom power. In addition, there's a 3.5 millimeter stereo mic input, which can be used on its own, or to give you up to four channels of 24 bit audio. Having this integrated so solidly into the handle is a really fantastic part of the camera and something I can't imagine being made available separately due to the very specific way it mounts onto the FX3. I've always worried about the XR K3M style devices because there's been lots of them over the years because the MI shoe connection isn't the most robust thing in the world, but on this handle with those screws it feels pretty solid. Unlike the XLR K3M unit, you don't get an included microphone or the extension cable for the MI shoe. Not having these is not that big a deal on this camera. I mean, the microphone was really never that great, but better than none. Uh, the extension cable I really do like, but there's no use for it on this camera with the handle because you can't relocate it, unlike you can with the K3M. There's also a quarter 20 mounting point on the grip which I think is for that really lovely thing called vertical video, my favorite. But maybe there is a secondary reason. There is also a really bizarrely placed quarter 20 just above the HDMI port. If you attach most things onto it, you will block that port. You could use it for an HDMI clamp though, as there isn't any other HDMI protector that comes with the camera, unlike with the A7S III. But maybe that mounting point and the one on the grip and the one underneath could be used with the upcoming AirPeak drone. Speculating, I don't actually know. There's quite a few changes to the positions of the dials and buttons. The top mode dial of the A7S III is now a button on the rear of the camera and the exposure compensation dial has completely disappeared. It's now purely done through menus and shortcuts. The power switch by the shutter button on the A7S III has now become a servo zoom controller. Although there are currently just two full frame servo zooms, I think, that work with this. But you can also use that servo zoom with clear image zoom. The actual power switch is now on the rear of the camera too. There's a nice big record button on the top as well as one on the front, a very welcome addition. The shortcut buttons are pre-assigned and labeled. You can, of course, change them, but we now have a white balance and ISO shortcut up on the top of the camera. And the rear dial also has marked preset functions. I really like the new tally lights, which you can turn off and on depending on how you want to use them. There's a small red one visible from the front. The record button on the top lights up and there's a really bright one above the LCD screen on the back. And in the menu, you can choose to have a big red border on the LCD screen when you're recording. 
there really is no way you are not going to know when you're recording on this camera. The last major physical difference between the FX3 and the A7S3 is there's now a physical fan to avoid overheating. The A7S3 could overheat in certain situations, but very rarely. Especially when you have the power off temperature set to high on the camera in the menus. Don't worry about engaging this as it has no effect on the image quality and does no damage to your camera whatsoever. It just makes the body warm up a little bit. What's that smell? I did some really rather unscientific overheating tests for this video, both with the screen folded to the body and flipped out. I can definitely get much longer with the screen flipped out with both cameras. Despite having the fan, I still did get overheating with the FX3 in the 4K 100 and 120p mode. I managed to get just over an hour at 22 degrees Celsius ambient temperature. And when it was at 44 degrees, I got about 25 minutes. This was with the fan set to auto, so it kicked in when it needed to. The A7S III with the screen closed obviously didn't get as long, but with it open, it got about 35 minutes. With a higher temperature of about 36 degrees, yes, yeah, so not the same as I had for the FX3, as I said, unscientific, I got about 20 minutes. Recovery time for both cameras is super quick. For the length of time it's gonna take me to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare, you could keep recording for, well, I'll tell you just after this. Whether it's waiting for your overheating tests to complete, which is highly unlikely because that's just a weird thing to do, or more likely waiting for your edits to render, but worse than that, finding yourself struggling to just focus on work. It's so easy to use that time in a way that isn't the best use of it. I find that if I don't keep my brain stimulated, I'm not the focused and productive person that I should be. I really am not myself. And that's where Skillshare comes in. An online community with thousands of classes covering a huge variety of subjects. Where do you find joy? In nature? In art? Are you feeling joyful right now? Or are you anxious? Or maybe just tired? When you face the blank page, are you filled with ideas? Or is it hard to know what to do? Learning new skills is it just something different for you? but also improving on things that you've always meant to be better at. And for me, that's Photoshop. And this brilliant practical course by Daniel Scott has set me on a path to finally master this software that I really should have done a long time ago. The first 1000 people to use the link in the description below will get a free trial. And after that, it's around $10 a month. So literally in that short rest period for the camera, you can record for almost as long as you did before it shut down. The fan definitely helps when things are really hot. How much, I can't say categorically, as I couldn't do any testing in the real world outside under a hot sun as it's winter here. Why anyone would need to record 4K 120p for this long in one continuous tape, I don't know. But if you really want the longest recording in this mode, you could use a dummy battery into a V-Lock or mains power adapter. Whilst editing this video, I did one final test using a dummy battery with the A7S III as the FX3 had gone back by then. And in that setup, with the screen out, temperature of about 22 degrees, I managed to get over six hours of 4K 100p. That is a lot and it would have kept on going, but I needed to stop it to get the camera back to do some other things. Most times in the real world, whatever that is in these days, you will be using the FZ100 battery though. But with either camera, if you ever do experience any overheating issues, you could use a dummy battery solution and a V-Log battery. And you should be able to keep on going much longer. The biggest thing that the camera had over the A7S III for me when I first learned about it was it had a Cinetone. But as I've mentioned, the A7S III now has, or is about to have, it via firmware. Now, I didn't know about this until I had shot all of my tests, of course. I spent a few hours down at Richmond Lock doing some side-by-side -side tests with the two cameras 
I shot in S-Log3 on both of them, and the FX3 in S-Cinetone, and the A7S3 in the fake S-Cinetone, which is the one created by Paul Ream of the Extra Shot YouTube Settings. channel. But the real test is with Sk Let's move this stick out of the way. Fun fact for you, Paul was actually my old boss when I first started at Sky News when I was just 18 years old. Anyway, that acetone was programmed into the camera via the picture profile settings, and it's actually really good, looking very close to acetone. Of course, now with the real one on the A7S III, you don't need the fake one, but I was really impressed nevertheless. But if you want the best dynamic range, you really should shoot in S-Log3, s Gamma 3 Cine, as s Cinetone does cost you about two stops of dynamic range. I think it's finally time to address the big questions of what's the point of this camera? Who's it for? And what could they have done differently to make it better? Well, in my opinion. By losing the EVF, but giving it a very nice professional audio solution, it could definitely appeal to people more than the a7s3 who exactly i'm not sure one thing about losing the evf which could definitely appeal to certain people is it's going to be much better on gimbals because it doesn't have that evf to get in the way and it is lower so you've got a better rear clearance for heavier lenses but you want to put the xlr handle on at the same time as that will get in the way this is the dji ronin rs2 with the Sony A7C and a 200 to 600 millimeter lens and it's balanced. Why? Because it felt impossible. Will I ever use it? No. Maybe it's for vloggers as they pretty much just use the LCD screen as they are mostly filming themselves. There is a front record button after all, so that is perfect for them. But the camera is more expensive than the A7S III, despite losing the EVF. But you do get the XLR handle. But then, is that of any use to vloggers? Because they hold the camera at about an arm's length from their face, so a shotgun mic on the XLR module will be too close to them and pointing over their head. And there's no way of angling it down, which is how you'd have a shotgun mic pointing at a subject. In the case of the A7S III, vloggers tend to use top mics that go into the 3.5mm input of the camera, like the Rode VideoMic NTG, or the really lovely MI Shoe cableless microphone, the Sony ECM B1M. Both of which are great and a much better audio solution for vloggers. So Sony, thank you for sparing me the misery of having to review this thing that I already had. For more money, the XLR inputs. Nobody uses that. We use lav mics tethered like a school child would. If it's me, I buy the Sony A7S III just for the on off switch. And it's slightly cheaper, slightly lighter. There you go. Clearly part of the price you're paying for the FX3 is that XLR handle. But if you wouldn't use it, and even if you don't use the EVF, the A7S III makes more sense, as at the time of the making of this video, it is much cheaper and is the same camera. You cannot buy the FX3 without the handle. Again, at the time of making this review, maybe that will change. Look, I know I am of a different generation to most people out there filming. I'm in my 32nd year of this business, which is longer than most of you lot have been alive. I did wonder if my love of the EVF was misplaced and I'm just old fashioned. And maybe people just used built-in LCD screens these days. So I did a poll on a couple of Facebook groups asking people how they used their A7S III's. There were different results in both groups. In one, the I only use the LCD screen came top. In the other group, most put that they used external monitors. Only using the LCD screen came in third. Now, I don't know how many of these people put down external monitors because they record with the Ninja 5 ProRes RAW. 
I should have asked that question really, because that is the only way to record in that format. So people clearly do like to shoot using the LCD screen a lot. I do too, but I also love using the EVF and it truly is an essential feature for me. When I was shooting these shots with the manual Suri anamorphic lens, to make sure I was in focus initially, I was using the digital punch in, getting it right there. But when I was rolling, I had to rely upon peaking, which has never been great, to be honest, and even in the EVF, but much worse on the LCD screen. At least with an EVF, I would have had a much better chance of accurately putting focus. And after I'd done the shot, I couldn't even check the shot back by looking in EVF to make sure I'd got it, because there isn't one. In playback mode on the LCD screen, you cannot zoom in on the shot to check your focus, only in stills. With an EVF, you have a nice big image so you can see if you've got it or not. The FX6 doesn't come with an EVF either. It doesn't even have the loop that the FX9 has. So I added my own EVF, the Zakuto Graticle Eye. So I tend to use that and the LCD screen, which I've moved to the back of the camera but I also frequently use an external monitor when I'm on a tripod, when I'm filming interviews. The problem for me with not having an EVF is I found I was shooting my handheld stuff way lower than I normally would. Yes, I am quite tall, being six foot two, and when using EVF, shooting handheld, maybe I'm a little bit too tall at times, but I could easily squat down a little bit. I just found that handheld with the FX3, everything was much, much lower because holding the camera up to your face to get that same sort of height is really uncomfortable. So by default, you do keep holding the camera much lower. When I first found out about the camera, it was via a presentation. And one of the things that was said was it has a cage built into it, so you don't need one. I would certainly recommend getting one if you buy this camera and intend to mount a monitor or an external EVF like the Zaguto Grasco on it alongside the XLR handle. I did try to set it up to show you what it would be like but I would not shoot like this because it didn't feel solid at all or robust. It also did look rather silly but a big part of that is the size of the EVF. I don't know of any external EVFs out there that are as good as the Kuto Gratical HD or the Gratical X that can be powered by a battery on the actual EVF. All the other ones need external power and there is no power out on the FX3. Just like the A7S3, there's only one tripod mounting point underneath. There's no additional locating hole, so your tripod plates will start to come loose and spin. A cage will fix this as it will give you many mounting points on the underside of your camera. Just be aware that you will need to buy a brand new one for this camera as no previous cages made for Sony cameras will fit. Trust me, I've tried because of the way that handle sticks out. Also, the camera isn't as tall as the A7S III. One thing that I would love Sony to make is something that I first showed in my FX6 review. It's an MI shoe tilting EVF add-on. The one I'm showing here on the FX3 is the one made for the Sony RX1. It's old, it's not the best EVF, and it isn't even compatible with the camera. But it's there to show the concept, and I think it's a really solid one. Yes, it does mean you couldn't use the XLR handle and that at the same time, but having a tilting EVF would be much more preferable than even the built-in EVF of the A7S III. And clearly, I'm not the only one who thinks this way, as Blackmagic's just announced Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro supports a $500 add-on tilting OLED EVF that they've made. And it looks really nice. For the Fuji GFX 50S and the original GFX 100, you can add a tilting EVF to that camera. It's using the same EVF, but you just add a bit in between. You can take off the EVF from the camera, sliding the tilting part, and then put the EVF on. And it isn't just tilting, it also moves left and right, or angling left and right. And it is absolutely amazing. If they did make it, they would need to sell it with 
something like the MI shoe relocating cable that comes with the XLR K3M. So you don't just have it on top of the camera if you don't want to, you can put it in different positions, which will be very important when using on video cameras like the FX6, because the MI shoe is on top of the handle, which is a dreadful place to put an EVF top of the handle at the front. The FX3 is a fantastic camera, but should it be part of this cinema line? Does it have the features that make it really part of this lineup? Don't forget this lineup has the Sony Venice in it, but does it matter? Is it just marketing? Is it just a name? It is very confusing though. In my FX6 review, I was equally confused as it had many things that were better than a more expensive FX9, but things which were worse than the cheaper A7S III. And likewise, the FX9 has things which are better over the FX6, but things which are worse than the FX6. The FX6's advantages over the S3 were much clearer. The main thing being the incredible variable ND, S Cinetone, which was not on the A7S III at the time, and the ability to control the noise reduction with the ability to turn it off as well as three strength settings. And that's one of the biggest downsides to the really high ISO performance of the A7S III and the FX3. The noise reduction cannot be turned off and it can become really aggressive, making the footage look really quite ugly. This made the FX6 the best 4K low light camera in the world. Whilst the noise is still there at the high ISOs, the detail is also there. And with post-production plugins like Neat Video, you're able to get some really fantastic results. In my FX6 review, I did complain about the somewhat clunky way the camera operated. It is more or less identical to the FX9, which I was fine with. It's just that in between those two cameras being released, the A7S III came out with a whole new menu system and a touch screen function shortcut menu which made the camera an absolute joy to use. And also the FX6 autofocus is a step back from the A7S III because there's no touch screen tracking. I wish that some of the innovations from the A7S III had made it to the FX6 which would have taken it from being a great camera to an incredible camera. I still hope that maybe they can in a firmware update. The FX3 has gone too far the other way. Well, it's gone completely the other way because it is an A7S III. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that. It needs to have a few key things to come over from the FX6 and FX9 to really justify its name and inclusion in the cinema line. I know some people would have wanted to have variable ND in this camera, and yeah, it would have been amazing to have it, but it would means something would have to go and that would be the IBIS because you can't have both and because you don't have an EVF you are shooting in a different way you need some stability and the IBIS gives you that so not having it wouldn't be a great idea so I think it needs to add the following as a bare minimum control over noise reduction shutter angle waveform dead on 24p mode after all this is a cinema frame rate and it's a cinema line camera and also DCI 4K. Right now for me, the FX3 sits in the Sony lineup in a rather awkward position. I'm very happy to be proven wrong and it could well sell like hotcakes. It's just the loss of the EVF makes it a no-go for me. But I really love the design and I love the handle, but then it would simply be a replacement for my A7S III. As you know, it's the same camera just without the wonderful EVF. I think the price of it plays a massive part of this awkwardness. Being more expensive than the A7S III, it needed to be more than it is. And the XLR handle isn't enough, not when you've lost the EVF, because you can get the exact XLR features of that without the handle with the $600 XLR K3M module. If the camera had the additional software features that I mentioned, I can imagine it's selling really well at the launch price. If the camera as it is right now was the same price as the A7S III, I think it would still sell 
you know, definitely would still sell. If it was cheaper than it is an S3, yes, it would shift loads. I don't know. It'll be really interesting to see how many of these cameras sell. I just don't know why anyone would sell the A7S3 at a loss to buy a more expensive version of it with no real actual benefits camera-wise. If you're looking at buying an A7S3, would you pay more to get the FX3 knowing it was the same camera internally just to get the new body, fan and XLR handle and happily lose the EVF? I don't know, quite possibly. I mean, let me know what you think down in the comments below. I normally feel like I'm pretty good at knowing if a camera's gonna do well or not, but this one has just left me so unsure. And considering it's such an incredible video camera and still a really great price for what it does, it is a really bizarre thing for me to say.